productivity can also be how you get back to yourself, how you get back to those around you, how you integrate self-care into your day, overall, how you just create more space in your life so you can go and do things that you really enjoy doing. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Hope you're having a beautiful day. Today, our episode is on intentional productivity, getting your life, home, and digital space together. This episode is jam-packed with tips to help you live better and more in tune with yourself. Our guest today is Jules Acre. Jules Acre is a YouTuber, founder of The Homebodies, and writer of the Slow Brew Sunday newsletter and podcast. Through the lens of mindfulness, Jules creates videos and lifestyle tools to help people slow down and find more ease in this digital age. Outside of this corner of the internet, Jules is a matcha drinking homebody doing life alongside her husband and two dogs in Austin, Texas. Hello, Jules. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing so good. I'm so excited to be on here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. So let's start with your story. Um, Tell us your story and how you became passionate about intentional productivity. So I started my blogging journey, I'd say about 10 years ago, and it was called Ohm and the City. So a lot of my intentional living and mindfulness is all rooted in my yoga practice. And that's kind of how I got started. So my initial content surrounded my yoga teacher training and the mindfulness that came from that journey and just me wanting to write about my experience and kind of where I was in my life. And so I started sharing online, sharing more about uh, doing a lot of yoga around New York City, handstanding wherever I could. And then um, eventually everything kind of evolved when I started to think of intentional living and mindfulness as something beyond my mat and something I can bring with me into my day-to-day. And um, it kind of evolved when I moved from New York to Austin. And that's when I kind of started to think more about uh, mindfulness and my space and how like my physical space, my digital space, and all these other things beyond like my internal uh, dialogue, how all these other areas of my life impact me. And so I got into intentional productivity kind of through you know, the journey of being an entrepreneur, having an online business and wanting to make my digital spaces feel really good and not just show up to my computer every day, you know, mindlessness and just trying to make it a space that makes me happy and feels good. And I would say you're very successful at that. Your digital spaces and your physical space are so beautiful. Like it's it's kind of like everyone's ideal. And I, I understand why people want to learn from you. Um, so why don't you define what intentional productivity is for people who haven't heard that term? For me, intentional productivity is less about the all or nothing where, you know, every single day is a new day. And when I wake up, I try to approach with that mindset of like, what do I need today? How can I honor where I'm at in my cycle, where I'm at in my body, and how can I align my habits and how I'm approaching my day with how I'm actually feeling in my body? So for me, intentional productivity is more about finding a rhythm, feeling more in alignment with me and my body and um, the things around me. So you're more in tune with how you feel each day. Like your level, your definition of productivity is different each day. Yeah, every day is different. And I think productivity is often thought of as like producing something, being on, creating. I think there's a lot of dialogue online that talks about, you know, more is more, doing more, doing it faster. And rather than approaching it as how can I do more and be more successful and make more money, I'm approaching it as what actually fills my cup and what to me is success? And do I actually need all those things that maybe society is saying like, oh, like, you know, you see on Facebook or all those different ads that might get served to you that say like, oh, how to make multiple six figures, how to make multiple millions and keep chasing these numbers. But for me, it's more about what do I actually need to live my best life? And what is my definition of that? And so productivity can also be how you get back to yourself, how you get back to those around you, how you integrate self-care into your day, overall, how you just create more space in your life so you can go and do things that you really enjoy doing. So you can like shut the computer off at the end of the day and go live your life. 
Right. And you don't have to feel guilty about it because all, like the self-care relationships, that is being productive, right? Yeah. All of those give back mm-hmm. to, exactly. you know, it's not just the output. It's also like the input. Yes. So what is your definition of success and what makes you feel like you can say, oh, I'm satisfied. Like today was a very productive day for me. For me, success is more about how I'm feeling as far as do I have enough space in my calendar? Am I feeling like I can approach my day with ease and feel really good about what I'm putting out there, what I'm creating, but also how am I doing in my relationships with my community, my husband, my family? Am I nourishing my body? I feel like there's so many different areas of our life that we, you know, it's hard to balance everything. It's not always going to be this perfect equilibrium. It's going to ebb and flow. But I feel most successful when I can look around and be like, oh, cool. Like I'm really loving the work I'm putting out. I feel really energized by it, but I'm also really excited that I'm hosting game night and I'm having my friends over and I'm reading books. Like all of those things make me happy and feel successful. Yeah. I love that. To me, that's like a holistically balanced life where you give energy to all the areas that matter to you. Yeah. And it's not always going to be perfect that way, but that's when you hit those moments and you can like pause and acknowledge it and be like, ah, this is what, this is what feels good when I can slow down and all of that is kind of falling into place. Right. Yeah. I know the reality, it doesn't always feel good in every area. So what do you do when things feel like imbalanced, right? Where you're like, I don't know, just, just how do you manage to, to feel that way? I feel like oftentimes, like I tend to get really excited about things. And so my natural disposition is to want to take on more and do more. And I have shiny object syndrome. I have idea after idea. And so it's, I can make my calendar very full very quickly if I, if I'm not mindful about it. And so when things start to feel off balance where I feel stressed or maybe like technical difficulties or just things pop up that I hadn't planned for, Um, I try to first remember that flexibility is actually the key for me is just to like remain flexible and know that, you know, there's things that I can't control and what can I let go of that I can't control when I, in my therapy sessions, I really love my therapist because she often reminds me, you know, um, there's just things that you hold on to in your body that you're feeling overwhelmed with. But when I can take a step back and be like, ah, you know, like, me worrying about it is actually not going to change the current situation. So what can I do to either like sit with it and breathe into it, feel where it is in my body, acknowledge it, and then just let it go out my feet. That's kind of like a visualization that I do. And then what can I do to either like take my mind off of it or be productive in another aspect? Like what can I control? So that's a long-winded response to basically saying, I try to check in with myself and see how I'm feeling in my body. And oftentimes getting away from the screen often helps me because if you're just kind of stuck on your computer and like trying to figure out whatever is causing you stress or whatever it is, um, being able to step away and then come back with like a more clear, composed mind typically helps me. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of what you do is like so much mindfulness, so much like tuning into your body and how you're feeling. Like what feels good if I'm overwhelmed? Where is that feeling? Like how can I ground myself? Like it's, I see the the yoga background. <laughs> I see it in, in the way you live and I love it. Let's take a moment for today's sponsor, Shopify. Our 2024 Artist of Life workbook is launching very soon. This will be the eighth edition of the workbook that has changed my life in countless ways. For the past five years, we've been proudly hosting our shop on Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without the struggle. Shopify has helped the Lavender shop reach customers from all over the world. I love how easy the interface is to use and how they organize data to show you how you can grow and improve your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US and is truly 
a global force, powering businesses of every size across over 170 countries. They also have the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn browsers into buyers. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TLL, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash TLL to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash TLL. Okay, so tell us about why systems are so important. I know you're big on like systems and habits and routines. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So I really got into the system side of things because I am naturally very floaty, very creative. I have, you know, a hard time focusing. And so for me, creating a system where I can put all my ideas and capture them, but then not let them rest in my brain and store them in my brain. I can put them somewhere that I can refer to later, but maybe not take action on them right now. So it's kind of started with that perspective, but then I really started to enjoy the process of creating systems. So Notion is, I know that you also love Notion Mm -hmm. and it's a platform that has really just changed everything about how I approach my business. And um, it's allowed me to create more space, but also become more intentional and realize, you know, this is the stuff that I'm focusing on this month. I don't have to look at everything like a giant uh, block of the calendar. This is, I'm looking at everything at once. It's more, I can take things piece by piece, step by step. And I loved creating those systems to help me kind of get all the things out of my brain and just into a system that helps me thrive. And so that really works for me as someone who can be very scattered and uh, unfocused. It's helped me create so much more focus in my life. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about the systems you've created in your life that have leveled up your life in a big way. So there's like the life side of things and the business and the work side of things. Um, but I would say from the business side, because it does kind of, you know, it kind of leaks into my personal life too, because a lot of what I put out there is tied to that, which I'm sure you can understand. But I would say for me in Notion, I have created like goal setting and figuring out what my vision is for the year and how I can manifest, you know, the things that I'm most excited about. How can I follow my curiosities more? So having a system or like a template that I created to dissect what my highest level vision is and then break those down into actionable steps quarter by quarter week by week, day by day. And I like that it's digital because I can move things around. I can delete things if I decide, hey, I actually don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't sound fun. Um, I don't want to just check off a goal just because I say like, that's a goal I set in January. But if, you know, April rolls around and I'm like, actually not feeling that, then that's fine. Like I can change that or I can move it to next year. So I like having, that's probably the first place that Um, being able to goal set and think of my year as a whole, not just from business, but also my personal life. It kind of helps me be able to, you know, find direction and purpose in my year. And then what about in your personal life? Is, are there any other systems that you like you're loyal to because they, they work so well for you? I have a very nerdy system of tracking my Korean dramas that I watch and (laughs) different like hobbies and interests that I have. And even though it's like, it's maybe seems not that important to me, it's important because it's allowing me to lean into something that's fun and engaging for me and be able to dive more into um, just being an adult that likes to do things outside of work and have more interest beyond what I do between like Monday through Friday, nine to five. (laughs) It's nice to have your hobbies, some like just visually like that in your notion. I think it's really cute what you do. Just having a place where I approach my personal interests the same way that I approach like my business and having that be just as important to me and just as valued, I think it's been helpful for me to find a little bit more balance. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about your habits and your routines in life. Like, are, Is there anything that you do every single day or every single week to keep yourself centered, grounded, everything? Yeah, I think the the one thing that I've been the most consistent with for years and years has been drinking matcha. And for me, it's just a grounding practice. And I 
when I'm like whisking my matcha, I think of like the day that I want to have or like the intention I want to set. And it's kind of like a little habit stack, but it's very, it's not something I have to think about now. It's just something that I do every morning. So like I wake up, I ask myself, how do I feel today? Like what, how am I feeling in my body? And just kind of do like a scan and then making my matcha. And then I try to get some movement in, but every day is different. So I try to meet myself where I'm at and also be mindful of where I'm at in my cycle. I'm not an expert with cycle syncing, but following my cycle and learning more about the different phases has been really, really impactful for me and allowed me to like have a lot more compassion for myself and ease and um, do what I can to kind of work with that. So why matcha? Tell us about the benefits of matcha or is it just the intentional like physical routine of just mixing it? I mean, I love the taste of matcha. I also like that it's caffeinated, but it's more of a grounding energy because it doesn't get you as jittery as coffee can be. But I love coffee too. I do not discriminate. I love my cozy drinks. Um, But for me, matcha, I just like crave it in the morning. And I think oftentimes like a morning when when you get started in your work day, a lot of the thoughts are like racing in your head. So there's just something about drinking my matcha, sitting at my desk and kind of figuring out what my day looks like. It just makes me feel like literally anything is possible. And so I try to do things in the morning that like, if, for example, if I'm trying to brainstorm something, I'll put it on my calendar close to like when I'm drinking my matcha because I'm like super amped up. I'm like, yeah, I can do this. (laughs) Oh, I see. Okay. That brings me to another question is how do you prioritize your tasks every single day? Like what do you have a system and what do you use to like consider, okay, oh, this is the highest priority or this is right. Yeah. So I see like on a day-to-day basis, things are always changing, but I have kind of my North star for the week or for the month. Um, and I use notion. I have a template that I created that is based off of my own system that I use with my team. It's called down to biz. And so essentially From that, we have like our projects that we're working on. We have, you know, our roadmap of kind of where we're heading for the year. And then from there, we kind of know what initiatives or things that we're working on, like the um, launching podcast or like any newsletter things. We kind of know what the high level intention is for that week. But then the daily tasks are very fluid. Like for my team, we don't really work on like, this is due on Tuesday. This is due on Wednesday. It's more like, hey, by Friday, like these things should be done. And we kind of keep it a little bit more flexible. Um, And I think that just allows people to be able to work with what, you know, work at their own pace. Um, But it allows us to make sure we're also like moving forward and getting things done. Right. You also mentioned another thing you do, and I can relate to this, is like you're really scattered. So you like have all these ideas, you write them down to come back to later. Because obviously you can't act on them like at that moment. So does does that system work for you where you like look at an idea later on? Because I find that if you wait sometimes, like you go back and you're like, wait, I don't feel like doing this anymore. Or like you have second thoughts about it. Like what it, I don't know. Do you have advice on how to pick up ideas with momentum? I think if it's an idea that you're actually really excited about, then it'll be something that kind of keeps popping up in your mind as kind of like a little ping. Um, And if it's something that you're curious about, I actually talked about this on one of my upcoming podcast episodes, but basically just allowing yourself to follow your curiosities and not feel like you have to go full on and commit. So doing like a little micro exploration of whatever this interest is. For me, I had the, I kept feeling these pings of like, oh, what if I started a podcast? But I literally said I would never start a podcast because I kept saying I would not be good at that. I'm not a good host. I'm not well-spoken. All these limiting beliefs of why I shouldn't do it. And so for years, I was just like, nope, nope, nope. But then I just started thinking more about, oh, it might actually feel really nice to just talk unfiltered and be able to share more and not have to have video B-roll to support like whatever I'm trying to say or record. Um, So I just decided, okay, I'm just going to set aside... 30 minutes and get my mic out and just talk and see what that feels like. And so just by doing a tiny little, like dipping my toe in, but knowing that I can also just put this idea on the back burner and not ever do it again, just allowing myself to test it out, test the waters was really helpful. And so just by doing that, I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. I really like this. I'm going to keep going and see what else happens. But also, um, 
I feel like a lot of us get caught up in thinking that whatever idea we have has to flourish into this big thing and it has to like last forever. And we kind of think of all the different steps of what needs to happen for this to be a launch. But I started approaching things in my business the way I kind of approach hobbies where it's like right now, this sounds really fun and I'm going to keep following that. But if in like six months from now, it's not feeling good anymore and I'm not, it's feeling more like a chore, then I might rethink it. And then it's okay if I end it. And it's totally fine to have seasons in our business or launch things. And it's good for a little bit. And then we decide we don't want to do it anymore. We don't have to keep doing things for, we don't have to keep dragging things along if it's not really feeling aligned anymore. Yeah, I like that flexibility. And it's, I, I like that concept of just like allowing yourself to explore just in a small way and not like, you don't have to commit to this like big plan. Just just try it out for a day or 30 minutes, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I like that. Okay, so you have a whole library of resources that you share, like worksheets, all these things. Can you share with us your favorite exercise that you recommend everyone do? For me, journaling is like the root of my of being able to be introspective and kind of take a step back from my life. And I don't know, I, I'm, I love journal prompts. I love um, any type of, you know, session where I can just sit there with my notebook or my iPad and write how I'm feeling that day or just not even have a direction, just kind of write and see what happens. Because I feel like a lot of times the questions that I have in my head or anything that I'm dealing with, I can sort it out. But also, we don't have to do it on our own. We can also tap on a friend or um, journal with a friend or go get coffee with a friend and be like, hey, like I'm really just feeling not in my element right now. And um, so I think a lot of my uh, approaches in the past have been very solo, very much like self-care and my own journey and my own like thoughts and feelings. But then realizing that um, you can also expand that out of your bubble and try to reach out more into community. Awesome. Okay. So next I want to ask you about getting on top of our tech and our home. Cause I know they're, they're kind of related. Like how do we combat clutter and your tips for someone starting out? Cause I, we look at what you have and it's so organized, intentional, but most people they're like, they're, they're over here and you're all the way over here. So what advice do you have for people just starting out on this journey that want to get a hold on their tech and home environment? Maybe we should break it up one at a time. Yeah. I would say for home, I mean, like it's very generic, but decluttering, you kind of can't get past that. Just like starting with, you know, the one thing that maybe you pass by every day that you're like, oh, I hate that drawer. Like just tackle it, like tackle one thing at a time or um, having like a bin that you keep tucked away somewhere in your house, but you can start up, start to like put things in there that you know that you don't want anymore. Um, for me, bins, baskets, organizers, those are for me kind of like a template, like a guideline to be able to say, this is your home. This is where you belong. And if you don't have a home, then maybe I don't need you anymore and I mm. should get rid of it. Um, or donate it. And so that's like the first thing is looking at kind of your own stuff that you have currently, but then also kind of looking more into your buying habits and deciding, you know, are you kind of mindlessly hitting checkout or add to cart on Amazon? But could you slow that down a bit? My husband and I tried a thing where if there's something that we think that we need, even if it's like a household item or, you know, something that maybe it's like a refill of something, we'll put it in our cart, but we won't check out till Friday. And that gives us like a few days to just make sure that we, you know, aren't just willy nilly buying things. And also, um, it also allows us to just kind of like have uh, that week to, you know, look at each other's purchases and things and make sure we don't act, we don't need it. Or if we do need it, then cool. Right. Are you both usually on the same page about how to organize your home and and do, like these habits like this, or is it usually like one person pulling the other? Oh yeah, it's totally me. <laughs> <laughs> like I I really get um, anxiety when I have a lot of clutter and things around me, and that's something that was a growing point for me and my husband over the years. Like we've been together for almost a decade um, and married for 
since 2020. And so like living together, we kind of learned, you know, this is my, um, this is what I consider clean and this is what he considers clean. And so yeah. trying to find that gap and bridging it and finding like a happy medium. But I also have come to peace a lot more with what actually is important and what's not important. Like, is it important that towels are like perfectly folded and stacked like this? Like I actually don't care anymore, but maybe like two, three years ago, I'd have been like, why can't you fold this towel? Like the, the corners aren't matching. Like why don't they match? But now I'm like, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you begin to compromise. I feel like I, that's my experience too, where I used to have this standard. And because my boyfriend is all the way over here, we have to meet in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And it's good because we really balance each other out. I feel like Andrew's very easy, go with the flow. And he allows me to also kind of remind myself, oh, it's not that deep. Like this isn't that important. But then he does, he's really receptive to things that are important to me. If I say like, hey, I get, I really need the kitchen to be clean at the beginning of the day because my office faces the kitchen and it causes me like, I can't concentrate when I feel like there's like a pile of stuff. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I get that. Like, let's work together on a system to make that work. So whether that system is do we do our dishes at the end of the day and we don't just leave them in the sink overnight? Then we wake up to a clean kitchen. Then cool. That works for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my follow-up question for that is, do you guys have a system in Notion for chores and things like that? How do you make sure things get done? What is, cause I'm sure every couple, like they have, you know, they're curious how other people do it. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have a system for chores anymore, but we did have a checklist at one point where it was kind of like, this is the reset checklist, these are the things that we kind of do on a regular basis. Um, but now it's kind of like clockwork, we know. Um, something that's really helped us is having that person fully own the task rather than um, breaking it up where like sometimes I would feed the dogs and then sometimes he would feed the dogs. And then we're like, who fed the dogs? And it gets kind of confusing. So now we have different tasks that that person fully owns all the time. And unless Andrew says like, hey, I'm, I'm like leaving early today, I can't feed the dogs and he specifically asks me, then I will feed them. So he kind of owns that specific task from start to finish. And then like, I'm also owning things start to finish. I think that came from the book Fair Play. Um, and that was very helpful. Yeah, but yeah, I'd yeah. say like other systems that we do have is our finances. So that's kind of how we, um, we use Notion to have these like monthly finance meetings that we've been doing for maybe four or five years now. And then I made a template and put it in Notion, of course. And then um, those finance meetings kind of also turned into like a relationship meeting too. Where we right. also talk about other things going on. And That's really um, good. You said, how often do you do this? Monthly. Monthly. Okay. So what do you mm -hmm. discuss with the, in the finance meeting? So we have a little... Um, template with little prompts. We call it finance flossing. And it's just kind of like routine questions you go through like, oh, like how is our spending this month? Do we have any big expenses coming up that we want to talk about? Where, what about our investments? Do we want to, you know, increase our dollar cost averaging? Do we want to move things around? How are we feeling? Just like checking in on all of that. We don't really set, I learned that budgeting is not really for me in the sense of categories, like saying, oh, you can only spend this much on groceries, this much on shopping, this much on dogs. Rather than thinking of it as like little categories and buckets, I think of it as, as long as we're investing the amount we want to invest each month and saving the amount we want to save and paying our fixed ex expenses, then whatever is left is kind of our, you know, mm -hmm. shopping money and food money right. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That sounds so organized. Okay. I so, have that template. Actually, yeah. I was going to say, I have that template in our um, Notion hub that I share with people who sign up for my email list. And that, Amazing. Um, yeah, it's like literally everything that we go through step by step. I love that. Okay. We'll share the link to that. Um, okay. Let's go back to getting on top of our tech. So if someone has like a messy desktop and no org, no system for their tech, what advice do you have for them to start? I would say, well, okay. So like your desktop is one thing, but I also think that we have so many different apps that we're using. So sometimes you're like using your Google calendar, but then you're using Asana, then you're using Notion, then you're using ClickUp. Like there's so many different 
apps out there. So I would say like find a way to simplify that and just pick an app that works really well for multiple areas so that you can start to, you know, not have so many different tabs that are open. Um, I also downloaded a browser recently called Arc. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but it has been a game changer. I don't even use Chrome anymore. Okay, how so? I would so? say, yeah, it's so, it, they're basically, um, they're a browser company and they're redefining kind of what that looks like. And um, like the tab is on the left side. I don't really, I can't, it's, it's easier for you to check it out than me explain it, but it's allowed me to like clear my tabs at the end of the day, but then also keep the things that are important. And it's just, you have to kind of experience it to yeah, understand, but I it's try ARC. It. Okay. It's so great. So that's been really good with my tabs and organizing those. Um, but I would say like my desktop's pretty simplify because anything that's on your desktop for me, it should be stored in a cloud. So the way I approach like stray files or things is like anything in my downloads, anything that's on my desktop, that's all like temporary stuff and can be deleted monthly or, you know, bi-weekly, whatever you choose. So if I have something on a desktop, then if it's important then I need to put it in the right folder in Dropbox mm, in a cloud. I so see. I'm always trying to clear space and um, manage all that. Right. So basically in Dropbox, you just have everything organized in in folders. Yeah. I have everything organized in folders. I have like my business, I have my personal life, you know, I save like, I'm very sentimental and I try to like screenshot things that I really like or take photos. What about screenshots? Do they just get their own folder? Because we Um, always have these random screenshots that we want to keep for some reason. Yeah, I know screenshots can get wild and like out of control, but I try to just like take care of it right away. Like if I screenshot something on my phone and it's like something I want to like save, actually save to look back on in a couple of years, then I'll like text it to my Slack or something or put it somewhere that's not just like in my camera roll. Okay. Um, Because if I wait, then I'm just going to forget. But yeah, so pretty much anything that's just like left in my phone or left like in a screenshot folder that can also be deleted because mm-hmm. anything important will get put in the place it needs to be put. Do you <laughs> delete photos on your phone? Like, do you clear out your camera roll? Oh, photos. Mm. See, photos, that's like videos. the hard part. <laughs> I know because um, it also syncs to like the desktop photos app on, I have a Mac. Okay, I see. Um, but man, I, I would say like that stuff is like really hard because like video is actually like what I'm trying to figure out how to manage because a lot of like the apps that I edit with on my phone still pull from those videos. So it's like I can't delete the video because then the video is broken in the app. Anyways, I feel like if someone can crack the code on the camera roll, like I would pay good money for that. <laughs> I, I think that will be the future. Like it's got to change. It's just too much right now. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Let's talk about your journey as a creator and entrepreneur, because I know you've been saying you, you've been doing this for a decade. So tell us about like the lessons you've learned. Like who, how have you evolved since you started? I would say like, maybe it's cheesy, but I feel like I, I've changed a lot, but I also feel like at my core, I'm the same person that I was at the beginning of all of this. But I think like over time, I started to step into having more confidence because confidence was something that I've always struggled with. Um, just like limiting beliefs or not feeling like I'm good enough or capable enough. Um, and that's just like a story in my head that I'm constantly just like, Hey, actually like you're good as you are. And like what you're doing is important and valuable and provides, um, you know, it's like helping other people. And so those things that, I mean, over the time, over the years, I feel like I've evolved from, questioning that to also stepping more into that and being like, yeah, this is, I've taken kind of an alternative path and maybe not everybody, you know, understands like my career path specifically and like, you know, thinking of like family and friends from like way back when, like those types of things, that was always a struggle. Just me trying to like not worry so much about other people think and following things that make me feel excited and things that I think that I'm genuinely good at doing. And so I've found more confidence and security in what I do. Um, I've found more fun with it because I think when you're first getting started, you want to make sure that you can like, you know, support yourself. I was living in New York City in a studio apartment and I had quit my job and I was doing this full time and 
didn't really know what was coming next. You can't really predict the future in this digital world because everything changes so quickly. Um, but I've always kind of been okay with flying by the seat of my pants and not always knowing what's next. Um, I feel kind of energized by that. So yeah, I think just like finding more fun and knowing that I don't know what the future is going to hold and being okay with that, but knowing that I'm enjoying their journey along the way and not just getting caught up in feeling, you know, overwhelmed or getting caught up in all the deadlines and things, but also being able to like step back and slow down and be like, whoa, this is cool. Like I'm doing cool things and I feel in alignment. I don't want to look back, you know, three, four or five years from now and be like, I don't even remember doing those things because I was so in it and had tunnel vision. So I feel like now I've been able to really step back and just like be more grateful and enjoy the journey. I mean, it must not have been easy in those early years. Any content creator, any entrepreneur will say like the early years, you're really like, everything's uncertain. You don't know if you'll make, like there's so much that you have to go through internally, externally. So how did you make it through those early years when you're trying to support yourself in New York City and you're trying to do this thing that's so different? Like what kept you going and what what made you, you know, have that drive? I feel like, you know, you can have all the strategies in the world, but if you don't have like trust in the process, essentially, like at the end of the day, no matter, you know, what insecurities might pop up, I still had this trust in myself that like, I'm not going to let myself, you know, not be able to pay my rent. Like I will figure these things out. And somehow I was never in a situation where I couldn't support myself. Every year since I let go of my uh, nine to five job and started working for myself, my, my income had increased every single year and I've never gone back. And so I don't know, I, I think I partially just kind of found peace and like, I'm doing it, doing the best I can, learning as much as I can, asking people, you know, talking to them, not just being like a little homebody recluse, but also tapping into my community around me. Um, and just trusting, it's more of a spiritual thing. I really can't explain it, but yeah, I just trust like you it. trust that you'll be supported and life does support you, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I think that's beautiful. Um, was there a moment where you felt like it all clicked for you? Because, uh, you know, you're kind of figuring it out in the beginning and then there's a moment where you're like, oh, this is what's working. This is what I'm meant to be doing. Like, was there a moment like that for you? Yeah, I feel like when I um, moved from New York to Austin and really started getting more into the intentional living, uh, intentional productivity, digital organization space, I started to feel like, ah, oh, this feels really good. And I really enjoy talking about these things. And because digital, digital life, all that stuff is really a part of our culture now. And we're not really ever going to be away from that. If anything, it's going to get more and more involved. And so if we can find a way, a lot of it's like a mental um, game essentially to try to clear the clutter of the stuff that's constantly popping up that we don't always have control over what's popping up, you know, as far as social media goes, like we open our phone and we can get sidetracked so easily because we're not in control all the time. So teaching in an, and also showing how different strategies work for me. A lot of the things that I create content on are things that I'm going through in my own life and navigating and just figuring out and just sharing that process with other people. My next question is, do you have advice on how to use social media more intentionally? Like, how do you manage that? Because like you said, we can get stuck on the apps and the notifications and scrolling. And this is a big problem that everyone deals with. And as a creator, it's a unique problem even more unique because it's like, it's our job and yet we don't want to give into it that much. So yeah. What's your take there? I would say willpower is not enough and we have to physically put those boundaries in place. So whether it's, you know, for me, it's like putting my phone in a drawer, using my focus modes on my phone and it automatically turns on at a certain time, you know, when I'm starting work and just out of sight, out of mind for me, I literally will be like, where's my phone? I don't remember where I put it because I literally tucked it away and it's not there. Right. Um, so just physically distancing myself from my phone as much as possible. And also like setting boundaries with certain times of when I'm going to use my phone. I don't like to be in my bed scrolling on anything. Cause I know that makes me feel really not good. Um, and you know, there's always 
fluidity with that if you're on vacation or whatever is happening. Um, but knowing more about how you feel and then putting those physical boundaries in place, I think for me has helped me be more intentional. I also deleted TikTok from my phone because yeah. I found that app a lot more addicting than any other platform. And I, yeah, I actually, it's been great not having it. It's been maybe like two or three months now. Um, and so I have it on my iPad because I do have to post on there for work sometimes, or just like, if I want to post, then I'll just use my iPad to post. So yeah. Nice. Okay. Next question is, do you have advice for releasing the guilt around being unproductive? Cause I think a lot of people deal with this as well. Yeah, I would say, you know, our bodies are going to tell us when we just can't no more, <laughs> when we just like need a break and we can either give ourselves that break and enjoy that break, or we can be in our heads and feel guilty about the break that we're inevitably going to take anyways. So to me, it's like, I am not going to feel guilty if I'm going to read a smutty romance novel and just like chill on the couch. And that's, me pouring back into my soul and being able to show up more fully in all the different roles that I have in my life. Um, guilt is just like an interesting emotion, but oftentimes like when it comes to productivity, I feel like guilt is a wasted emotion mm -hmm. and we can, I don't have like a perfect answer for how to alleviate guilt. But for me, it's just been like our bodies are cyclical and we're always going to need those times, like some seasons are more introspective and slower and some seasons are more fiery and creative. And when you zoom out at the, when you zoom out and see your life as a whole and you see all the peaks and valleys, that's kind of what makes it cool and makes it your journey. And so it'd be really boring if your life just looked like this the whole year. So I just try to lean into that knowing that, um, yeah, things are always ebbing and flowing. Right. Because ultimately, I think guilt comes from having like that high expectation for yourself. That's sometimes unrealistic expectation for yourself to always be on. Right. And just like you said, get, you need to pour back into yourself and that in itself is productive. So I think it's just about like changing your mindset on, on your definition of productivity. Right. Yeah. And if guilt is something that you're feeling because you think you should be doing something because somebody else wants you to do it or kind of looking at what are the external factors that are leading to that guilt and how much of that story is actually true and how much of that is just something that you're kind of putting on yourself and getting in your head about. Yeah. I realized so much of like my mindset in just teens and early 20s was just that those like basically it's like an imaginary expectation or these like beliefs that don't really have like a true backing. It's just for some reason you were raised to like feel this way or your mind developed to, to think, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And you realize it's all just imaginary. <laughs> like there's really nothing that you should be doing. <laughs> And a lot of things, you know, culture is also woven into that, having very high expectations, feeling like others hold very high expectations of you. Um, and so it's really hard to kind of rewrite that story and unravel all of that and decide for yourself, actually, what do I expect of myself? What's how much is realistic and how much is just like this imaginary thing that I've just kind of had ingrained in me since I was a little kid. <laughs> Okay. Next question is uh, on procrastination. So do you procrastinate and do you have tips for overcoming procrastination? Yeah. I mean, we all procrastinate and I think that's a totally normal thing. Um, I, I think it kind of depends on like what is actually important in getting done. Cause some things like don't have to be done right now or don't have to be done, you know, as urgently, not everything is urgent. And so kind of learning how to prioritize what needs to get done or how can you take things off your plate for me recently and a situation that I felt like I was in, I was feeling stressed because I kept procrastinating on recording more podcast episodes because I'm leaving for Korea on Sunday. And so I wanted to have like all these episodes like ready to go. So it's all scheduled out and I was going to drop weekly episodes. And I just like couldn't, I just couldn't find it in me to like hit record. And I felt like I had to do other things. So I kept putting that off. And that felt like a stressful situation for me because I'm like, oh, I'm not going to have enough episodes. But then my husband was like, why does it have to be weekly? I'm like, oh, 
actually, there's nobody telling me that it has to be weekly. Like it could actually be biweekly. And then if I want to do weekly later, I can always change it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you are a genius. I'm just going to change my (laughs) intro. It's going to be biweekly for now. And no one's going to be mad at me for right. No one cares. Yeah. (laughs) So, so yeah, that like simple tiny tweak that I made has allowed me to be like, okay, cool. I'm good with the amount of things I have recorded. I'm going to go enjoy my trip now. So that's going to be more memorable to me. (laughs) Yeah. Like less stress. Like that was unnecessary stress. And now you can just go have fun. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Oh, I'm so excited for you. (laughs) Thanks. Okay. So next, let's talk about what you're excited about because you talked about your podcast. So so what inspired you to start this podcast and what is it going to be about? So my podcast is based off of my newsletter, Slow Brew Sunday. And that is something that um, I really just loved writing over the years. And that's how I got started in the first place was like writing on my blog. So it really feels like OG blogging days. Um, and so I wanted to have an outlet to be able to, you know, connect in a different way in a different medium and through audio sounded, it just sounded fun. And so I'm not really thinking, I don't, like I said, I don't really have like a whole strategy. I'm just leaning into what sounds fun. And so far I'm enjoying it. Um, And we'll just see how that goes. (laughs) Well, what type of content is typically in your Slow Brew Sunday newsletter? Um, So Slow Brew Sunday is all about sharing intentional productivity tips mindful shifts and just like tiny little actions that we can take to make us feel better in our day to day. So it's all about slowing down, simplifying, simplifying and finding what feels good. And I share personal stories of, you know, overcoming limiting beliefs or how to stop being chronically overbooked, how to create more space, how to tap into the power of pause, things that are more themes that I have worked through in my life that I'm just sharing with other people. And right now it's a solo podcast and Mm -hmm. maybe I'll have people on at some point, but for right now, it just sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah. How long are these podcasts going to be? They're pretty short. Um, I'm trying to keep it around like 18 to 25 minutes because, okay. yeah, I just wanted to because feel... solo, it's like you have to talk the whole time and it's, it's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that too. Like, honestly, I was talking and like, wow, this has to be like 35 minutes, but it was like 18 minutes. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I have to talk so much. But yeah, yeah I think um, for me, I wanted something to be short. So short enough that people feel like they can, you know, um, I don't know, wash dishes and like do their laundry. It's digestible. There's always actionable takeaways. Yeah. So that's nice. I like that. I'm excited for you. Can you share some of these like tiny shifts that you talk about in your newsletter and podcast? Like what are some action steps or, you know, some tips that we can take away today? So, um, in an episode that's coming out soon, it's about, um, being chronically overbooked and how we are always adding more to our plate or saying yes to things. And so I share a, just the thought of pressing pause because a lot of times we think like, oh, I got to get back to that email or, oh, I have to like give them an answer now, but realizing that not everything's a priority and what's urgent for some people doesn't have to be necessarily urgent for you. And so I share like seven different questions that I go through to kind of assess like, do I have the bandwidth for this? Am I actually like mentally and emotionally in a place to take something like this on? Or am I saying yes out of guilt? Am I saying yes because I think I should? Or is this something that I'm like really excited about? Or even if I am excited, do I even have like the space in my calendar? Just little tiny questions like that that can help us reassess why we are constantly ending up in a place where we feel like we're just going from one thing to the next and have so many things on our plate that we don't have any downtime or time to just like relax and get into the flow state and do something creative. Um, So yeah, just like tiny little prompts and shifts that can be put into action right away. I love that. Um, Do you have like a structure in your day where you're like, oh, at this time, I'm going to like shut everything off and and devote my time to K-dramas or myself? Like how do you structure your days? to allow for that self-care time? I try, I mean, I, I created like a YouTube video about how I block my calendar. This is a couple years ago and I have themed work days. So some days are my potato days where I'm like, not, I don't have to put makeup on or get dressed or look a certain way because I'm not filming. I'm not on camera. And that kind of gives me permission to just not have to constantly be on. So 
I'll have like my potato days. And then I also have like my creative days where I'm maybe taking meetings or just like batching things where I'm already in that zone. Um, and it's helped me find more balance that way with creating content. It's not just a free for all, like any day could be a content day because that feels stressful for me. And some days I just want to wear my yoga pants, um, all day long and that's that. So, um, yeah, I kind of try to start my work day around like eight 30 or nine. And I try to end my work day around five, sometimes earlier. And I also try to take Fridays off or make Fridays my like cafe days where I meet up with friends and co-work or I'm doing more like af- life admin tasks and just having that Friday open, no meetings, no like major things that I have to like focus on. It's more like keeping space for me to do other things that are in my weekly to-dos. Yeah, I like that. And then about the part where you're, you know, if you have a lot of ideas and you want to fill your plates, but it's obviously we we don't have, we have a limited bandwidth. So how do you like approach like working towards all these different projects? Do you limit yourself to focus on like one main project at a time or do you just like devote a little bit of time for each idea? I think it kind of depends because some projects require different energy than others. And sometimes you might be fired up to work on something, but then the other one you're kind of not as excited to work on at the moment. Um, So I think I kind of just gauge based off of like how things are flowing and how things are feeling. Um, But I do have like projects that I set goals for at the beginning of the year where I said like, okay, by the end of Q3, I'll have this launch and I'll have this done. And so, um, knowing like kind of like what the end goal is and end deadline per se, which deadlines can always move, but having that in mind, I tried to like pace my work so I can get it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Do you have any final like advice for our listeners today who, you know, who who want to live more intentionally, more productively in that like holistic definition, like any final messages? I feel like we have all the answers that we need within us. And I think if we just slow down more and tune in, our body gives us a lot of signals and signs. And if we try to work more in harmony with that versus trying to you know, work at somebody else's expectations or schedule and try to tune more in, then we'll, you know, be able to honor our needs more and uh, be more in alignment. I love that. We have all the answers within. It's so true. We're always looking for answers outside of us. And yes, we can find inspiration, but truly like, you know, what's best for you deep down. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, Jules, where can we find you online? You can find me on YouTube, Jules Acre, on Instagram, and my podcast, Lovery Sunday, and my shop, The Home Bodies. When does that launch? Or is it or has it already launched? It just launched last week, so it's <gasps> brand new. Okay. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so Slow Brew Sunday. Slow Brew Sunday. Yeah, it's a newsletter okay. and a podcast. Amazing. All right. Everyone will link everything in the show notes below. Thank you so much, Jules, for sharing all of your insights and your tips today. And I'm sure people are curious to learn more about you. So they'll, you know, make sure to check her out. Jules Acre. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. (laughs) 